Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kristen, and this is Laura, and we are with Grow MIC, and today we are celebrating the release of The Crudes, A New Age. Um, many thank yous to our friends at DreamWorks and The Crudes for sponsoring this workshop today called Gardening with The Crudes. Okay, so in the movie, if you haven't seen it, the Crudes are hunter-gatherers, which means that they have to travel all over to find food. And in the new movie, the Crudes meet a family called the Bettermans who have figured out agriculture, which means that they can now grow food for themselves and they no longer need to travel from place to place. So today, we, Laura and I, and our friends, Belt, <laughs> we are going to teach you how to garden like the Bettermans. So no matter whether you are growing indoors or outdoors, if you're growing on your windowsill, if you have a garden in your yard, no matter where you are and how much space you have, we are gonna teach you to some very basic gardening skills to grow a lush, beautiful garden like the Bettermans in the movie, The Crudes. So let's jump into it. Um, Laura, why don't you tell our friends say about some of the techniques we're gonna cover in the workshop? Yeah, so some of the techniques that we saw in the movie are things that we can do right here from our homes as well, whether we have outdoor space or indoor space. So today we're going to go over how you can sprout things at home, um, how you can use water propagation to make more plants, um, different ways of irrigating your plants, how to plant things, how to harvest things, how to save your seeds, and to bring it full circle, how to compost like the Bettermans. Awesome. Okay, let's start with sprouts and microgreens. Um, both of these are so fun. They're super easy. You can do them anywhere. It's really satisfying because they are ready to harvest in like one to two weeks, so a super quick turnaround time. All you need to do sprouts or microgreens is an upcycle container, which Laura has right there. Um, Laura, I think you, you, you poke some holes in the top too, right, to make it a little breathable. Yeah, and yeah. so this is just a container I found in my recycle bin. Um, and I kept the top because it's clear, so it'll let the sun in, but I did poke some holes to make sure that some air could still get in to circulate. And so what I did here is I took my container, I placed a few paper towels on the bottom of it, and then the, the fastest thing to grow I found are chia sprouts. So you can use the same kinds of chia seeds that you actually eat in yogurt and smoothies. They can sprout into plants. So um, you're going to wet your paper towels in here, sprinkle a bunch of chia seeds in the bottom of it, um, keep it in a sunny windowsill, make sure it stays wet every like all the time. Um, so I use my little spray bottle, which makes makes it nice and moist inside of there in my little makeshift greenhouse. And in one to two weeks, I got these sprouts here that I can cut off and use in um, salads, soups, sandwiches, anything you want. It's pretty fun and very fast. And if you wanted to do a microgreen, which is like a slightly more substantial baby plant that you can kind of use the same way as you could a sprout, instead of using the damp paper towel, you can just use some soil. So same thing. And then when your little greens come up, you can take a scissor and you can give them a haircut and use them in your smoothies, salads, however you want to use them. But um, super easy and just make sure that your towel is not too wet, like you want it to feel like a wrung out sponge because too much water is not good, but a wrung out sponge would be exactly the right water level you want for your sprouts. Okay, um, next up, well, you can sprout beans. So beans like you might have in your pantry already. Um, one super important, yeah, Laura, Laura has you some use, You want to use dry, <laughs> dried beans. So you can't use canned beans, but anything that is a dried bean, you can use as your seed. What kind of bean do you have there? These are black beans. Okay. Um, yeah. but I've done it in this picture. You can see I tested it out with like chickpeas, black beans, and some sort of heirloom like kidney type beans. Yeah. And so it looks like all you did was you dampened your paper towel the same way you would have if you were going to do a sprout or a microgreen. You tucked up your, <laughs> your beans and then you covered them. And one really smart thing that I see you did here is that you labeled them because it is so easy to forget what you sprouted <laughs> and when. And so when you just marked like what it is and what date, then you'll know how long it will take you before 
you should start to see. And how long did it take before you saw some action on your beans? beans? The beans only took a few days. So after just a couple of days, I saw some of them already had sprouts on them. Um, and so you want to keep an eye and check on these every day. I do date them because I have a lot of plant experiments going on at the same time. And each of these beans is a little different. Like one of them didn't work very well because it got moldy, but the other one sprouted great. And so you can kind of end your experiment there. Or once you have the sprout, you can plant your sprout into soil and grow a bean plant. And we're going to talk a little bit later about what some of those containers can look like and some fun like do-it-yourself home ways to grow a little bit techier, a little more better mini than maybe <laughs> um, just regular containers. So we'll talk about that. But next up, we have another technique to help populate your very lush overflowing garden, whether it's indoors or outdoors. Um, and that's propagating herbs, or really you can do this with, with a lot of different plants, not just herbs, in water. So Laura's got some cilantro over there. Just some regular cilantro that she picked up when she was doing her grocery shopping. This was and, about three weeks ago as well. And oh. the cilantro is still alive and flourishing because I put it in water so that it can actually stay alive and keep growing. Awesome. Um, and so if you were going to propagate, if you wanted to take your cilantro that you bought from the supermarket, you would take a little cutting and then like Laura, you put them in water. Um, there is a specific way to cut it. So Laura's got her cilantro there and you can see it's got some some leaves um if you were going to put you would want to remove those leaves uh so that they're not submerged in the water because that might make your water a little bit mucky but also it cleans up what's called the node so laura can you show the node on there yes so this part where i just picked off the leaves that's the node and you can tell it's like a little bump in the stem and so leaves were growing here, but now that I've picked off the leaves, if I put this in water, roots will grow from the node instead of leaves. And yep. once you wait like two to four weeks with something like cilantro, basil, mint, um, <clears throat> or you could try with other types of herbs, once you get roots out of here that are about an inch or two long, you can plant it in soil and have a flourishing plant. Yes, um, and you can do this with house plants too. That's like a super popular way to make a million plants out of just really one. I have like gigantic monstera <laughs> plant here that's just in water that we propagated from an even bigger monstera plant. <laughs> and I should also like for all of the things that we're showing you today, we are just below in this post, there's gonna be some instructions on how to do more of this too. So, um, so be patient. Uh, also, okay, so let's say that you have sprouted your, your bean and you've got a little bean plant going, you need a place to put it, or you've propagated your herb or an house, a house plant in water, and now you need a place to transplant. Um, you can use any kind of container, but we really enjoy sub-irrigated planters, which you can make out of water bottles or a soda bottle. And usually when we think about planters, we think about the kind that we water from the top with like a watering can, say, or a spray bottle. And that's called top watering. But if we are sub-irrigating, it means that we are watering from the bottom of the plant. And there's a couple of reasons why that's good. Um, the first is because you, if you're not very good at watering, like I am, and you never know if you've done like enough or, or too little or, or what, um, in a sub-irrigated plant, your plant is going to tell you how much water it needs. So you don't have to guess as much. And how it works is that you cut your bottle in half, the bottom half you'll fill with water, the top half you're gonna flip upside down and fill with soil in your plant. But before you do that, you're gonna connect the bottom water reservoir to the top growing soil with a wick. And a wick can be a string, it can be an old t-shirt that you've, you've cut into a slice and you've like twisted and put between. Basically you're making a straw and when your plant's roots are thirsty, it's gonna draw water up and that water is gonna come from the reservoir that you've made in the bottle. And when the reservoir is dry, that could be days, it could be weeks, it really depends <laughs> on your plant and the conditions in your house. All you have to do is refill the reservoir. And so it's, it takes the guessing out of like how much to water your plants, which is why they're fun. This is like a small indoor, I mean, you could also do this outdoors, but um, you could you could use the same method 
in a planting bed as well. So um, we'll have the plants for these in their blog post so you can take a look if you wanted to build these at home. But just know that you can do this on a small scale or you can also scale this up to something bigger and conserve your water, which is really important as the, the Betterman's learned. Water is a very important resource for gardening. And this type of agriculture technology has actually been around for a very, very, very long time, um, ever since agriculture was invented. Cool. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about potatoes. Potatoes are super easy to grow. There's a reason that they're a food staple around the world and that's because they're not very picky about much of their environmental conditions. They, they are really not picky when it comes to soil. They're very easy to care for. Um, and they might even and, start growing in your pantry. <laughs> in your, <laughs> which is what looks like is happening to your potato. So yes. when we're looking at Laura's potato, we can see that it's got eyes. And each of those eyes has the potential to become a new potato plant. So what Laura could do is she could cut her potato into cubes. Each cube would have a, a little eye on it. And then she could dry them out for 24 hours. So she might just want to lay them out on, you know, some uh, paper towels or grate or, or towel, regular towel would be fine in like a sunny spot to let some of that moisture and, and water leave the potato. And then she could plant it. And what's fun about growing potatoes is that they take about 90 days. And when you first plant the potato, it's going to send up its stem and it's going to sprout its leaves like as, a, as any plant would. But what you'll want to do is add some soil. So like when your stem is about eight inches, you'll want to add some soil to that because it tricks the plant into continuing to grow so that you get a bigger potato. <laughs> um, and there's all kinds of ways to like vertically grow potatoes so that you can get more potato yield out of a smaller space, but you can grow them in containers and you can do it indoors. They're gonna want some sunny space. So we'll, we have some tips later about how to like make sure you've got a good sunny space for them. Um, but like a, mil a, a milk crate would be a good size container so that they have plenty of room to spread out or like a five gallon bucket would also be a good um, growing container for a potato. Or you can use a burlap sack on a fence like the, they're really not picky. So um, it's a fun thing to grow if you've got 90 days and you can do this with any kind of potato, sweet potato, yellow potato, little tiny bit, you know, there's so many different types of potatoes, but the growing system is the same. <laughs> All right, um, if you have patience, and if you would love to have a really beautiful indoor plant for a while, then ginger is also really fun to grow. Um, this is an example of a milk crate that we just talked about in the, in, when we were talking about potatoes. So this is some ginger that we had growing in our, our office. And we took a milk crate and we lined it with landscape fabric so that we could fill it with soil and the soil wouldn't fall out all over our office floor, which you know wouldn't be very popular. Um, but you have to have patience for ginger because it takes like a good eight to 10 months before you'd be able to harvest like a regular big chunk of ginger like we're used to seeing when we grocery shop. So Laura's gonna tell us some tips about how, to, how you would go about planting your, your ginger. Yeah, if you're trying to use ginger that you buy at the store and you want to plant that, try to look for fresh ginger. So that's the kind of ginger that does not have the papery peel on it. It's just um, it's just like fresh new ginger. Um, sometimes you can get this more mature papery ginger to also sprout. So it's just try to see what you can find at the store or at the at you know farmers market. See what they have there. Um, this one is definitely you need to have patience for because even when you plant these ginger rhizomes underground in our in our milk crates, we had to wait four to eight weeks to see any action. So you kind of have to trust and wait and see what happens. Um, we kept the milk crates in the warmest part of our office because we it doesn't need sun while it's underground. So we kept it in a little storage closet that accumulates a good amount of heat. And that'll help encourage your, your ginger to grow because they are tropical sun loving plants. <laughs> so just try to give them as much heat and light as you can once they pop out of the ground. I will say that it was worth the eight to 10 months 
because harvesting these it was so fragrant and like it, it was just awesome like you know everybody knew that like ginger was being harvested in our office <laughs> and if you are the kind of person who just can't wait to get your hands on the ginger you can harvest it earlier at around four months of growing um, and it'll be like a more gentle less potent tasting ginger okay and so back when the Bettermans were figuring out agriculture, they could not just go to the store in the spring and buy new seeds for planting. They had to seed save. Um, and so this is the bell pepper that I use. You can use this technique on a lot of different types of produce. I ate my bell pepper as I normally, no instructions needed there, just ate it. And then I saved the core. And all I did was I just with my finger, I took the seeds off very gently and if there were any seeds that were maybe browning or, or darker, I separated those. Um, so you, you want to make sure that all of the seeds that you're saving are healthy. And then I wash them. Um, when you save seeds, you want to make sure that there's no um, plant material that's remaining because that will, that will rot or cause mold. So you want to wash them off thoroughly, remove any kind of residual um, stuff. And then you can either put them on a paper towel, or in this case, I used a coffee filter because it helped to absorb some of the moisture. And I had them on a sunny window for maybe a couple of days. And I knew that they were done because they snap in half when you pick them up. They no longer have that like rubbery seed feel to them. Uh, they just snapped, they dried out. At which point I put them in an envelope, sealed it up and put the date on it. And they are ready for planting when I'm ready to um, you can keep them as long as they're in a dry, cool place, uh, they'll be fine for a while, but, you know, just make sure that it's not like a super humid or too hot space, um, because that can impact how likely they are to germinate. It's good to keep them in like a paper bag too, instead of a plastic yeah. bag to reduce humidity. Yes, agreed. Okay. Oh, and so if you really want to bring this full cycle, like the veterans did, you can compost. Um, we have composting, there's there's ways to do it indoors, there's ways to do it outdoors, there's many, many, many different techniques for composting. Um, we have a longer tutorial on this, so today is just a teaser, but the Bettermans were composting, and that compost is really important to the long-term health of the garden. Um, so Laura, do you want to tell us a little bit about this indoor worm bin that's... <laughs> yeah, so in the picture with the hand, that's actually an indoor worm bin composting system. And it's a very simple type of uh, system. And we had it in our office and I swear it did not smell bad at all. <laughs> if you're doing composting right, it should not smell very bad. Um, it should just smell like organic material. So you can see there's little worms in there. You can choose any type of container, whether you wanna do a small one, even like this size, or you could do one of those huge storage bin plastic tubs. Um, <laughs> And you just have to get your worms, and which you can buy red wiggler worms or find them if you know what you're looking for. <laughs> and you'll have to add, you have your food scraps, which are your carbon, you want to do like a carbon rich material and nitrogen rich material. So you need both the, the food scraps as well as things like cardboard, newspaper, um, or dried leaves, things that are like dry and crinkly. Try to think of that. Um, and you mix all that together. You do little bits at a time. You want to keep an eye on it. Make sure that you're not adding too much of the food scraps. That'll make it smell bad. Um, so you can try to do this indoors or you can use an outdoor system that's a little less uh, like particular. Um, but there's all different ways to compost. And if you don't want to do it yourself, maybe you can find a community composting site where you can just drop off your food scraps and they'll compost it for you and Lovely. give you some beautiful finished compost at the end, which is rich in so many nutrients. And instead of going to a landfill, your food scraps have now created this beautiful, rich material that you can use to grow even more food. Also fact, if you look at the food scraps on the right side, you'll notice they're a little bit frosty looking and that's because these were in the freezer. So if you're a little worried about like uninvited guests to your compost heap, Freezing will often take care of that. And it also cuts back on some of the smelly factor that people are afraid of with composting too. So that's another little tip. 
Um, but if you want to learn more about composting, we have more resources on that for you. All right, so we couldn't do this workshop on gardening with the prudes without talking about berries because look at these beautiful pictures of berries that guy is. <laughs> it's a it looks like a, a little bit of a hairy strawberry, which we're <laughs> it's a little unusual for us, but um, I'm not familiar yeah. with that variety. <laughs> no, no, I think I prefer my strawberries not so hairy, but um, we're going to talk to you about growing strawberries because you can grow them inside and you can grow them outside as well. They can grow great in containers. So many of us are not growing in huge outdoor spaces, but a container will work. Um, they will need about six to 10 hours of direct sunlight. And so if you are, um, if you look in the resources that we've put with this post, you'll see that there's a sun mapping activity and that could be great for you if you're not really sure how much or how direct sun, um, how much or how much direct sunlight you're getting in your proposed growing space. So that could be a fun way for you to test it out. Um, berries are super quick. We plant them in like the end of April, beginning of May. And then once they flower, they're ready to harvest in about four weeks. So usually we're harvesting strawberries in June. So it's a really quick, short season. But if you've ever grown them, um, you'll know that they love to spread. So strawberry plants like here in this picture on the left-hand side, that's your plant, right? And then they will send out these little runner plants. And these are little, little daughters that will just become more strawberry plants. And maybe that's fine if you have a lot of space and you wanna dedicate a larger growing area to, to berries, then by all means, let them spread out. It's the more berries, the merrier. But if you're trying to contain them a little bit, you can take that runner and you can just kind of tuck it back into the container so that it can't continue to, to spool out and send out more runners, or you can share the runner with a friend so that they can start their own little um, strawberry plant as well. All right, and if you are growing <laughs> strawberries or a lot of the things that we grow for fun means that there are other things that will enjoy what you're growing just as much as you will. So um, Laura and I were both really big fans of this prehistoric chicken or you know, whatever you want to call it. Every time it screamed, I definitely giggled in the <laughs> movie, but I'll let Laura talk about protecting your garden from pests. Yes, so um, in the movie, the Bettermans used this gigantic wall to keep out certain types of pests that they didn't want bothering them. So that's one direction you could go if you want to keep out <clears throat> gigantic chickens and other prehistoric <laughs> animals. But um, something that's can also be used to protect your chickens or your garden from chickens or, or squirrels or things like that. Um, you can see here in this picture, this is our teaching garden on Governor's Island. And we do have chickens that like to roam. Sometimes we're fine with sharing our garden bounty with our chicken friends. Sometimes we wanna protect things like our berries. So what you can do is um, find a fine mesh netting that you can use year after year um, and you can use little sticks or small stakes and put a netting over the things you want to protect in your garden. So that's one option. Um, also, it could be protecting against birds or <laughs> maybe not chickens, right? For for many of us, but this other will work types of other types of birds, and yeah. <laughs> even some even some bugs, like there's netting and fabrics that are. Um, uh, the, they are like see-through enough to let light and moisture through, but fine enough to help exclude insects. Yeah, floating row cover is great for insects because it has no little holes for anything right. to get through, but it does still allow moisture, air, and sun to get in there. And you can use those for temporary periods of time over your plants. Um, if you're trying to keep out certain types of bugs, there are these make your own organic pesticides um, or insecticides that you can use. There's some that are just as simple as washing your vegetables with, or using yeah. a little dish soap that um, is not toxic. So we have some other recipes for that in a different pest management workshop, but there are a lot of options um, for protecting your garden. Yes. Okay, and even though we are, have been teaching you to grow and garden like the Bettermans, we're going to talk for a few minutes about foraging like the Crutes, um, because there are many 
plants that grow in our gardens, whether that's indoors, uh, sometimes indoors and also mostly outdoors, um, that we consider weeds, but they actually have a substantial nutritional value or maybe they're used for medicinal purposes. Um, so weeds can be food. And we're gonna talk about a couple of examples, but I think it's really important when we talk about foraging Number one, never eat anything if you are not sure. Um, always check with an expert if you're not comfortable identifying something yourself or even if you just want a backup opinion. And two, never ever forage where you can't vouch for um, where you are foraging from. So if it's your own yard and you know that the soil is, is clean and free from um, any kind of contamination or animal activity, um, then that's, that's great. But if you're not, when in doubt, um, we don't recommend foraging. So let's show you a couple of weeds that are edible. So the first is purslane. Um, this is a succulent plant that you can actually eat raw in say a salad. Um, it's crunchy, it's kind of citrusy or like lemony, a little bit like, like spinach, I would say. Um, and I, recently, I feel, I feel like a lot of restaurants have, have adapted purslane and you're seeing it more <laughs> because people realize that there's like a good nutrient quality to it. Um, how you can identify it is that it has ovalish leaves on a very red stem. It tends to spread across like garden areas. If you leave it be, the stems will actually get extremely thick. Um, and it has pairs of leaves that grow directly across from each other on the stem. Um, it does flower and when it flowers, they are small and yellow. And this is just the teaser to how to identify purslane. We have a longer post on more traits of, of purslane so you can recognize it in your garden if it pops up unexpectedly, or maybe you even wanna grow it on purpose, but just know that purslane is a pretty cool thing to, to forage. Um, Next option, if you live in New York City, you have probably walked past mugwort a hundred million times. Um, it is a prolific grower. Anybody that has ever gardened outside knows that if mugwort pops up in your garden, it's extremely hard to, um, to remove it from your garden. <laughs> All it takes is a tiny little bit of a leaf to actually start a whole new plant of it. Um, but it's but it's edible and it has a lot of medicinal uses if you could get past the bitterness of it. Um, one of the easiest ways to identify mugwort is that it has a very distinctive like musty smell and it can, it's tall. Each plant can go for, um, oh, Laura, correct me. Is it, I wanna say each plant can grow for about two years. So they're pretty substantial in how they set up shop in a garden. Um, yeah, that's but why they, gardeners don't always love to see it <laughs> an invasive species that it's hard to get rid of. Yeah, um, but it's it's got like a the underside of its leaves are grayish white. It's got like a finger like lobed leaves. Its stems are fuzzy, um, and the older it gets, the the thicker the stem gets, and the less fuzzy. It can kind of almost look like a purplish leaf. Uh, sorry, purplish stem with a longer, more slender leaf. So it takes on some different looks as it matures and ages over its rather long lifespan. And again, we have a longer um, post on how to identify mugwort. And the last one is lemon hearts. Laura, let me let you, let me let you do lemon hearts. These ones are like what would be considered the candy of edibles <laughs> because they kind of taste like a sour lemon candy. Um, they're called also called yellow wood sorrel but the reason they're called lemon hearts, lemon because it tastes like citrus and heart because the plant looks like clovers, but the difference with lemon hearts is that each leaf is actually shaped like a heart. So that makes it one of the more easily identifiable edible weeds out there. I've seen this growing in garden beds and everywhere all over the place um, in many different regions and climates. So you've probably encountered it before um, it has little yellow flowers that come up in the summer, and you can eat this, the stem, the leaves, the flowers, the buds are especially sour um, <laughs> and give you that like gusher type of feel, I guess, if you're comparing <laughs> it to a candy. Um, and they're pretty, they're pretty fun and have a very distinctive flavor. 
Awesome. Um, no gardening workshop about the crudes would be complete if we didn't talk about Eep's butterfly gardens. So Eep here is our love struck teenager. She loves butterflies and she loves flowers and she's very taken by them when she meets the Bettermans and sees their garden. Um, and Laura is also like extremely passionate about pollinators. So I'm going to let her talk about how we grow for pollinators um, and why they're so important to our gardens. Yes, so growing for pollinators is actually a great thing to do for your other plants as well, um, because the more pollinator plants you have, the more pollinators you'll attract to your garden, the more pollination that will happen among your plants, which will increase the yield of um, crops that you have from your fruits and vegetables. So um, planting for pollinators is, is great because it'll smell delicious because they're flowers. It'll look beautiful because of all the different colors blooming throughout the season. And it'll help a lot of your other plants be healthier, um, produce more like squash and tomatoes and cucumbers and all these other things that rely on pollination in order to produce a fruit. Um, and it'll also help your local ecosystem um, because these pollinators need places to collect pollen and nectar and uh, it's always great to create more habitat for them. It was hard for me to try to fit plants onto one slide here. So there's a million more plants that I could have put on this list, but some of the most popular ones that gardeners will grow to attract pollinators are zinnias, bee balm, milkweed, butterfly bush, calendula, asters, and sunflowers. There are so many more plants out there, so we'll link you to a list that has more plants. Um, this will attract butterflies. It'll also attract honeybees and native bees, which are really important for your garden's health and our ecosystems. You can see here in this picture, we've got a swallowtail butterfly on top of a zinnia. And these plants look really beautiful to us, all these different flowers, to the way that the that eyes work in the bees and the butterflies, they're gonna be drawn to these types of colors. They, they see things in so many different, such a different spectrum of light, like ultraviolet and things like that. So you wanna to try to plant a lot of different types of plants um, because certain ones are only attracted to certain types of plants. And you also, if you wanna go the extra mile, plant it out so that you have plants that flower in early spring, mid spring, late spring, summer, and fall, so that throughout the entire season, you have a buffet of flowers for the pollinators to enjoy. What's fun about these um, pollinator plants is that some of them are also edible for humans. So you can eat the same things that the butterflies and bees eat. Uh, this picture in the corner here is borage, which is a blue star-shaped flower and um, Honeybees love them as well as humans. You can put them in salads. Um, people use them to decorate cakes sometimes, little cupcake garden party type of <laughs> vibes. You can freeze them into ice cubes and add them to lemonade. Um, and they have this really lovely floral taste to them. Um, some other edible pollinator plants are nasturtium flowers. Love nasturtium. Yes. And I love like even the leaves are edible and they're so spicy, almost like a, a radish. And it's just, it's, I love it. It's like delicious and not what you think it's going to taste like, which makes it extra fun. Yeah. They, the flavor profile is always described as peppery. And I remember eating it and I was like, whew, that wow. is yeah. peppery. <laughs> um, and they're also packed with vitamin C, I learned. So health benefits Ooh. there as well. <laughs> and then you've got lavender buds you can use if you grow an edible type of lavender. Um, other things are if you grow sunflowers, you can harvest the sunflower seeds. Um, bee balm is really popular and super fun to, to eat because you can pick off each blossom and suck the nectar out of it and it tastes really sweet. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can plant. Even things like basil, if you have basil in your garden and you let it allow it to flower by allowing it to mature. Um, that is awesome for bees and butterflies. They love, they love basil flowers. I'm so guilty of always pinching off my basil flowers so that it keeps my 
my basil going a little longer <laughs> but I, until the end yeah. of the season and then I it's just true it <laughs> and I'm like you can be wild now <laughs> right <laughs> all right and then we've got native plants too why are native plants important Laura so native plants are a great thing to incorporate into any butterfly or pollinator garden um, because these plants that are native to your ecosystem and the pollinators that are native to your ecosystem have been co-evolving together um, for a very, very long time, maybe even as long ago as when the crudes roamed the earth. Um, <laughs> so the native plants um, are great for the local ecosystem. They're really suited for the climate. They are um, used to the amount of rainfall that your area gets and the weather conditions. Um, sometimes they're, the native pollinators are only able to eat from native plants. So you, you can actually support native pollinators by planting these. Um, you can see in the picture I put up black-eyed Susans, which are just one of the many native plants for New York City region. But you can look up your region's native plants. And I like to use this tool all the time from the National Wildlife Federation. So we have a link to that um, in this resource as well. So you can look up and see what types of plants would be great in your butterfly <laughs> garden. One other good thing about native plants is that they're less maintenance as well. You don't have to do much to take care of them because they're so used to growing wild. That's it. They've evolved to fit this environment perfectly and they don't need us very much. So <laughs> good entry level gardening. Okay, so if you are enjoying this workshop today, um, we have so many more crude themed activities on our distance learning page, which is here. Um, so if you want to do your own like do-it-yourself recipe on how to smell like flowers and fresh rain, like Eep says to Guy at one point in the movie, we have a recipe for that. Or if you are looking for some things that you can watch through your window box like Thunk does, we have some bird ID guides for New York City that are fun to check out. Um, we have some guides on carnivorous plants and all kinds of things that we had so much fun and enjoyed in the movie, but didn't have time to do in our workshops today. So we wanted to give you some fun stuff to do at home. And there's also an activity book that the DreamWorks team and the Crudes came up with that have even more fun stuff to do at home. There's a recipe for shark milk, uh, <laughs> which has no milk from sharks, but lots of really delicious like smoothie ingredients. Um, and there's ways that you can make your own treehouse. So that's also here for you on our distance learning page in the post below. And the last thing that I will say is that we, we wanted to inspire everybody today to to grow and to try something new, and if, even if it's, it's new to you. Um, in the movie, Guy, who's, who's here in this slide, he says that he is following the sun for tomorrow. And any time that we are growing, we should always think about tomorrow and practice safe, sustainable growing practices that leave the earth and our people better than we found them. So um, we hope that you enjoyed today's workshop and that you'll try some of the things that we, we mentioned and you can feel free to reach out with, to us with questions at any time. Uh, but thank you for tuning in and happy growing. Thank you, bye. Bye.